Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Dirty Boots Show. This week we have Carl Mecklenburg of the Denver Broncos. So welcome. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you. We're happy to have you. For those who don't know who you are, the select small few group, tell us about <laughs> yourself and uh, how you got started playing football. Wow. Uh, I got started playing football when I was 10 years old. I okay. uh, played football all the way through, um, retired when I was 34, uh, 12 years with the Broncos. Um, had the opportunity to be a captain. I was a player rep for the Broncos. Uh, had a lovely time playing football. I just, I just loved football. The, yeah. the contact, the, the preparation, the teamwork, the, the whole, you know, the whole thing was great. Yeah. So a signer is obviously one of the Denver Broncos sponsors, partners. That's how we got you here. All right. Um, were you drafted by the Broncos? I was. I was the 310th pick of the 1983 draft. I was a 12th rounder. Okay. Uh, I got a phone call at midnight the second day. I was already asleep. It was a Broncos secretary named Jenny Ann who said, <laughs> Carl, we're going to send you an airline ticket. You had to mail them back then. <laughs> and we're <laughs> we're going we're gonna to bring you out and uh, just start practicing right away. I was one of the 110 guys at training camp that year. Um, found a way on the team through special teams and pass rushing. And uh, uh, my third year there, they switched me to linebacker. I made the... Uh, Made the Pro Bowl that year as an All Pro linebacker, and congratulations. Things, things went on from there, but 12 years with the Broncos, only two losing seasons. Which, wow. Uh, things have changed a little bit. <laughs> Hopefully, oh, no. we can get back, to, <laughs> get back to that. Yeah, so that's pretty unusual, though, to spend your whole career with one team, right? You know what that means. What does it mean? That means I was underpaid. <laughs> that's what that means. That's what and that that's means. why you're here working <laughs> still. So you didn't start out as a linebacker? I did not. I was a nose guard when I was drafted. Uh, they switched me to defensive end. I tore a ligament in my elbow that training camp. They switched me to defensive end because you can do that one-handed. I played the season as a defensive end, and they left me there for, uh, for another year, and then the next year, linebacker. And Actually, for a lot of my career, I was playing all over. I played all seven defensive front positions, sometimes in one game. They wow. moved me all around, wherever they thought the ball was going. And as a defensive guy, that's where you, that's where you want to be. So what would you play in college? I was a defensive tackle at the University of Minnesota. I was a defensive end at Augustana College before that. Um, so, yeah, I've always been a lineman until that, that fateful day that Joe Collier said, we got a need here. Uh, we got a lot of linemen. We think you can play linebacker. The way I went. It's, a, it's amazing to me that in every company, and every construction company, there's people who are out of position. Mm -hmm. you know, there was a job opening, they applied for it, they got the job, but really they'd be better somewhere else. Yeah. And, and, and what a great coach does, what a great leader does, is identify who's the, who those people are, what their skill sets are, and, and, and move them. Put, them. put them in a position where they can help the team more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really important. Um, what is the role of a linebacker on the football team? Well, as a middle linebacker, which I was, I was the guy calling the signals. I was the guy making all the adjustments. It was a big move, you know, coming from my hand in the dirt and staring at the ball, and as soon as the ball moves, I go forward. That, that was my job, basically. Uh, and then all of a sudden, I'm off the ball, I'm up. Anytime anything moves back there, anybody goes in motion or anything, then all of a sudden, I'm the guy that has to point that out to everybody and make sure they're shifted over right and move back and forth. Um, and every game, there's adjustments that you make depending on formations. And so sometimes those movements will all of a sudden change the formation. Then I got to change the defense and make sure that, uh, you know, the, the outside linebacker way out there hears me. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, it, was a, it was a big change. It was like moving from, uh, you know, being on the line to, to all of a sudden uh, you're in a leadership position. And it was, yeah. it, it was, it was good for me. You yeah. have people depending on you. Have people depending on you, and if, if they're not where they're supposed to be, then you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Before, it was if I wasn't where I was supposed to be, I was in trouble. But yep. no, and I would say if everybody. Now you're I'm responsible charge, for everyone. Right? I'm, I'm responsible for all of them. Yeah. So obviously, NFL is glamorous. How hard is it making it to the NFL? I have no idea, truthfully. I, I, w I was not expected to make it. Yeah. Um, I was a 12th round draft pick. Like I said, I played for 12 years. The average career in the NFL is three years. Um, so they come and they go and they come and they go. I found that, that, that what you had to do is make yourself irreplaceable. And how'd you do that? Indispensable. Well, uh, first the leadership things, uh, mm -hmm. the mentorship things, um, being somebody who's versatile, 
uh, able to able to you know take on whatever they asked me to do. I did. I had never played special teams in college or in high school, but that's how I made the team. It's like okay, I can do that. I'm, I'm gonna give it a shot. Having the courage to try new things, I guess, yeah, would be the thing that that really stood out for me. And and the second thing was decisiveness. I operate under what I call a sports mentality: prepare thoroughly perform decisively, evaluate honestly, and adjust accordingly. If you can do those things, uh, whether it's in construction, whether it's in relationships, whether it's in whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, you've got a chance to be successful. So that's the secret. Speaking of a sports mentality, yeah. do you have a podcast called A Sports Mentality? I do, yeah, and it's, it's available anywhere. Um, I've just started it up. Uh, we got, I don't know, six, I think, uh, episodes out there. Nice. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I'm not just talking to athletes, though. I'm talking to a couple of pilots I've talked to, um, business leaders, uh, and athletes. And, and interestingly enough, they all kind of come back to, yeah, I actually, that's kind of how I did it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it's interchangeable across industries. So really you is. used it to your success for the Broncos. But anyone can really take the tools to be successful. Sure. Who would you say was super impactful to you in your career and mentored you and helped you be a successful leader? There was a number of people. My college coaches were huge there. Um, there was a guy named Mike Wynn at the University of Minnesota who was the first one to tell me if, if you can rush the passer, they'll find a place for you in the NFL. My senior year at the University of Minnesota, we were behind all the time and nobody passes the ball when they're way ahead, so mm -hmm. I wasn't rushing the passer. <laughs> Therefore, the 12th round draft pick, but... Uh, but once I got to the NFL, that's how I made it, is, yeah. is rushing the passer. Joe Collier, Merle Moore, Stan Jones, that was kind of the defensive um, uh, mind trust of the Broncos. Where those guys were the coaches, and, and they were able to move me around and trust me enough to, to do the things that they allowed me to do. That ability to, to coach me up so I understood what was going on, because it's a... It's a very different job being a lineman and being a linebacker and, 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 and them taking their time to do that, I know really made me uh, what I was in the NFL. Did you play under the same coach your whole time at I the Broncos? I did not, um, but it wasn't like it is now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, two coaches in 12 years. Uh, That's pretty yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, it was Dan, Dan Reeves and then Wade Phillips for the last couple of years. So, yeah, it was, uh, it was great. One of the challenges with uh, with football now, especially with the Broncos right now, is there's so much change, there's mm -hmm. so much motion. If you if you know what the guy next to you is going to do without looking, then you've got a chance to cover for their weaknesses, and they're going to cover for your weaknesses, and you you understand how to work together. If you don't have that connection, it's really it's really difficult. So many players coming and going, and then when the coaches come and go, the coaches and the draft and and the general managers draft people based on the system that they're in right now, right? So you got a whole bunch of guys that were drafted uh, for coaches from last year and the year before. And now there's a whole and new now staff. There's another guy who <laughs> wants different people, and it and it it really makes it difficult to be successful. The offensive lineman under Vic Fangio's uh, offensive scheme, it's a drive blocking scheme. Uh, when uh, the last guy came in. It's a zone blocking scheme, and it's a completely different skill set, completely different guys that you want. And now the guy who they just hired, it's back to a drive blocking scheme, a power running scheme, and it, it's it's really difficult to uh, to be successful that way. Yeah, I, I look at it as as you have to know who you are uh, as a player. I, as well, know who you are uh, as a team. Um, know who you are as a as an organization. Mm -hmm. It has to be clear. It has to be consistent. Pat Bolin, at, when he was our owner, it was we're here to win championships, and we're here to serve Broncos country. That's who we were. It was clear. It was consistent. And if you didn't fit in that box, uh, he'd find another place for you to work. I mean, that that's just how it was. We haven't seen that around here for a while. I I, I think the understanding of who we are and, and where we're going has has been lost. And if you don't have those things, and it's not just on the football field. I, again, it's with family, it's with community, it's with business, uh, it's in construction. If your guys don't know what you expect of them, how, how do you expect them to, to fulfill your needs? It yeah. just doesn't happen. So be clear and consistent with those things. And the Broncos have recently gotten new ownership, right? So do you see any of this changing? I really have seen some change already. Having solid ownership, having people who are in charge, there's no question about who's in mm -hmm. charge now, 
and, and making decisions, then you can get that consistency. You can get that um, that follow up and the ability to to build uh, a culture that allows you to win. Because the difference between winning and losing in the NFL isn't players. It's it's uh, it's mentality. It's it's uh, scheme. It's it's uh, it's culture. It's it's we expect to win every game. I was a rookie the same year John Elway was, right? So, so I played my whole career with John. And we knew as a defense, if we kept it close, we were gonna win at the end, because mm -hmm. they were amazing at that. And, and we, we were able to take chances and do stuff that other teams weren't able to do because we weren't afraid of getting behind. That type of adjustment within a team is, is, is what happens when you, when you have that consistency and you play together for long enough. And the coaches trust you and you trust the coaches and they, they make calls based on, uh, on, on what the, uh, the situation is and, and, and who the people that they already understand what they're capable of are, are going to do. It just um, allows you to do that little bit and, and win. When, when the Broncos won Super Bowl 50, what year was that? Uh, six years ago, seven years ago, when Peyton Manning was quarterback mm -hmm. and that, that mm -hmm. group. Uh, they were tied or behind in, I believe it was 12 of the 16 games. They were winning at the end, and they were winning because they, they, they had that little bit of extra, of, mm -hmm. extra of understanding of, of what they were going to do and, and how they were going to do it. And it, was, and it wasn't just one guy. It wasn't necessarily Peyton. If you look at the statistics, his statistics weren't very, very good that year. But what he was able to do is got to get everybody else lined up and, and, and allow them to do what they did best. Yep. And it's like that in any organization, of course, in football. But it, leadership comes from the top down. And if you want to be successful, you have to start from the top. No question. So I see your rings. I got some rings. I got a couple more at home. But Tell me about them. College? Pro? <laughs> no, no. This is a, this is an AFC championship ring from okay. 1989. I played in the Super Bowl three times. We lost Fine. all three, unfortunately, but they still give you a ring. Uh, and participation trophy. Uh, it. It's a little different. <laughs> <laughs> it was AFC championship. We we got we got there. Um, and uh, the other one's uh, Broncos Ring of Fame ring. So they put my name up inside the stadium, and there's a little pillar thing out front. Congratulations. Thank you. What is the Ring of Fame? How'd you get into that? There's a committee and they select you. It's like the Broncos Hall of Fame. Congratulations. Thank you. So you're clearly retired now. I'm actually not. <laughs> Am I going to see you on, <laughs> on a Sunday? No, I'm retired from football. Um, like I said, the average career in the NFL is three years. I played 12, so I retired from football when I was 34. And what have you done after? I'm a professional speaker. I do about 40 keynotes a year all around the country, a lot of them for construction companies or construction associations. It's fun. I, I get to perform and I never get hurt. It's, <laughs> it's perfect. So you still live in Colorado. Have you been here since you retired from football? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is home. Uh, we moved here in 1983 and uh, bounced around a little bit. I'm, I'm out in Aurora now and, uh, and love it. It's, uh, this is home. How have you seen the city change? in oh, the last has, couple of decades. Yeah. It's, I mean, there's least, a crane least, out the yeah, window right, right now. Right, yeah. <laughs> it's like almost tripled now population-wise. Um, obviously, the, all the building and construction and stuff that goes with that. Was the stadium that's currently here the same stadium you played in? No, it was not. It was not. We played in the old Mile High Stadium, which is was was built in the parking lot of where the new one is. It needed to be brought down and, and redone, and, and it looks like they're going to redo it again. Uh, yeah. Which is, which is kind of exciting. Hopefully, uh, the way the NFL finances work, um, everything's divided up equally between the 32 teams. So ticket sales, uh, television, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're going to buy a shirt like this, Broncos keep 132nd of it. Yeah, they profit share. Right, except for stadium income. And that's concessions. That's concessions, that's parking, that's uh, other people renting the stadium out for concerts or, or meetings or what. So that's how you compete financially in the NFL world is mm -hmm. by having the newest, best, biggest, you know, most functional in the right place. You own everything around it stadium. Um, and and uh, so that's why there's so many new stadiums being built and why a stadium that's, what, 10 years old is the oldest stadium in the NFL, I think. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> like, it's, it, 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 that, that's how they compete. 
let's talk about safety. So in construction, in our world, safety is a huge thing. There's a ton of committees. Everyone is constantly reviewing the OSHA requirements, making sure it's keeping all of its people and its employees safe. Right. Over the last couple of years, the NFL seems to be taking a liking to safety. Yeah, and that's What was the safety like <laughs> when you played, well, and safety, how has uh, that changed? Yeah. No, I, uh, I've had 18 football-related surgeries. Uh, I, that's a lot. I missed five, no, well, seven games, actually, in my, in my entire career. So you just played with whatever was wrong with you, unless your backup was better than you uh, in your injured state, and that, that was it. I mean, our, our concussion protocol was how many fingers? <laughs> two. <laughs> it's always two, so you say two and you go back in. <laughs> now, now you're out for a month, uh, and, which is good. It was a change in focus. And if you, the, I mean, it's the ultra macho world of the NFL, right? These mm -hmm. are guys who have fought and scratched and done anything physical they possibly could to get to the top and get these opportunities. And they don't want to come off the field. Mm -hmm. Somehow the NFL has changed their culture. And they've changed it just by education. They've changed it by making sure the guys understand, you know what, you're going to have a better career, you're going to have a better chance to help your team if, if you heal up first before you go back in. And that, that change really was pretty quick. It was within, within Couple years. Yeah, four or five years where you're still seeing little things that happen, like happened to Tua this year where mm -hmm. you know, he got knocked out and then he got knocked out again and they were denying that he was knocked out, but everybody watching the game knew he was they knew. knocked out. They knew, yeah. Uh, so there are these these little flashes of going back to the old way, but it's not it's it's completely changed, and it's and it's completely changed for the better as far as the the health of the players. Do you think it's going to increase the longevity of careers? You said average is three years. Do you think these safety protocols are going to help that at all? Yes and no. If you're Tom Brady, you can play till you're 50 or whatever he is. <laughs> Retire, come back. <laughs> right, do those things where back in the day it was okay to hit the quarterback and jump on him and step on him and do whatever you wanted to him. Uh, and so they didn't last that long. Um, the interior guys, it doesn't really change that much. And, and usually the reason you get fired from the NFL isn't necessarily that you got injured. It's that you're hired based on your talent, but that's not necessarily what makes you great in the NFL. So your, your, abil your athletic ability um, is, is what they can test, what mm -hmm. they can see. The college game and the pro game are very different. It's very mental in the pro game. And, it, and you've got potential to be a good pro player, but if you don't fulfill that potential within three years and they got to give you another contract, which is going to be bigger, they'd rather replace you with potential. So they just keep going back to the well until they find guys that are indispensable and you know they, they can't they can't see the team without them on it and then they keep you yep do you have a favorite teammate that you ever played with wow or maybe i should say a few so we don't hurt anybody's no, no, feelings no no <laughs> i'm not gonna hurt anybody's feelings um somebody asked me who was your best teammate recently okay let's I go like with that, that question uh, who was your was best G teammate and gary, why gary kubiak was our our quarterback um when I first got there, uh, Gary was drafted in the seventh round in 1983. Um, Gary was a unbelievable player in college. He set every record he could set, but he was all state twice in football, in basketball, in track, and in baseball. That's incredible. I mean, just a, a, a freakish athlete, right? He gets to the Broncos, we're practicing, gets into training camp, we're practicing, and then the Broncos trade for John Elway and Gary Kubiak isn't going to play. And he knows he isn't going to play. And despite that, he did his best. And he was he was unbelievable teammate. He, he was our scout team quarterback most of the time, which means he's imitating the guy from the other team. He didn't do it begrudgingly. He is not only would he, uh, would he understand what the Broncos game plan was, uh, so if John got hurt, he'd get to play. But he'd also... Um, study the other team's quarterback and see where he threw the ball against certain defenses and how he threw the ball and, 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 and was just uh, an unbelievable teammate. He'd come up to me before every game and say, Mech, hold up the class. And what I looked that at that, well, what did that mean? Well, I thought, well, it's probably <laughs> we were drafted the same year, right? So maybe that's what he meant, mm -hmm. but it was more than that. It yeah. was, Carl, I've done everything I can all week to get you ready to play this game. I'm gonna be on the sidelines with a, with a baseball hat and a clipboard uh, hold up the class, do your job. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, what a great teammate. Yeah, there's a big life lesson in that for sure. Did you ever get into coaching? 
I coached some high school ball for my son's team just because I wanted to be a part of his team. Mm -hmm. but, but that's all. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't, and, and part of it is because I know me. I would get dive in. One of the reasons I retired and when I retired is because I needed to be with my family and, and I still feel that way. So I like what I do though. I'm, I'm a professional speaker. I travel around the country doing keynotes and uh, meeting people and, and hopefully inspiring some long-term positive change for both them individually and their teams. Mm -hmm. You have a son. Does he play football? I got two sons. I got two sons and a daughter. The daughter would have been the best football player. She's <laughs> She's I mean. love it. <laughs> right? They didn't do that back then. Um, and, but, my, but they do now. Yeah, my oldest son. My oldest son actually was a good football player. He was a. Uh, he, he played on John Bolin's team at uh, Kent Denver. So I got to coach Johnny Bolin. That was pretty fun. But he was all state at that level, and he was recruited by college teams. But his passion was music. He was a musician, and he, he got tired of beating up his hands. So he said, "No, I'm 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 done with football." Do you have a favorite stadium you've ever played in? Yeah, it was called Mile High Stadium. <laughs> <laughs> it's not there anymore. It's been knocked out. Not this one. <laughs> not this one, the old one. Um, yeah, <laughs> our, our home stadium was so awesome. And the, the people there and the noise and the, I mean, we had such an advantage. You'd see the big fat guys from the other team sucking on their oxygen. And you're like, we got them now. <laughs> Plus all the noise, uh, you know, it allowed us to get off the ball so much quicker because the offensive linemen had to watch the ball too because mm -hmm. that's the only way they could they couldn't hear anything. Do you think that is a huge advantage? The elevation in Colorado? Of course. Yeah, of course it is. I, I it's it's an advantage in any sport. I mean if you understand if if you're first of all if you train here, that's why the Olympic you know, training centers in, in the Springs. Springs yeah. Right. Is 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 to you, you you develop a whole different level of being able to 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 operate if you can operate at this at, at this altitude you, you develop more blood cells and it's just it's just a better thing for you physi physiologically you don't get tired as fast the other thing is it's psychological i mean people come in here thinking oh no i'm going to get tired well what do you do when you think oh no i'm going to get tired you get tired i mean that's yeah. what that's what happened football's funny football football uh if you time a game from snap to whistle and it's a three-hour game generally, right? From and just just the actual action is mm -hmm. less than ten minutes of actual action. And if you play on defense like I did, you didn't play on offense too. Uh, then it's five minutes over three hours. That's why big fat guys can do it. <laughs> but it's also amazing to me that when I see people take themselves out of a game because they're tired, it's like how can you be tired? Train five harder. Minutes. Yeah, get in shape. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Your words, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> right. One of the other things, talking about how football has changed over time, is the transfer portal. Do you think it's helping guys get to the league and not getting stuck at a college that they picked, or do you think it's having a negative impact on the players? I think it's both. Okay. I, th I think, for me, success is overcoming obstacles on the way to your dreams. That's what it is. Um, Sports mentality. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> I, to, to me, if you're in a situation where you're not happy, look at yourself what am I doing how, how, how have I affected this and again whether it's a, a relationship thing a business thing a sports thing more often than not there are things you can change to to change the situation now if there's not I, I transferred when I was in college I was at Augustana College in Sioux Falls South Dakota I was there on a one-third scholarship with the understanding if I play well, they give me a full scholarship. I, I led the team in sacks. I played every down on defense. I was a leader on the team. I go in for the debriefing session with the coach at the end of the year, and he sits me down, and I'm thinking, oh, he's going to give me that scholarship we talked about in my mm -hmm. family's living room when they were recruiting me, right? Uh, he, he sits me down, and he says, Carl, we know your dad's a doctor. He can afford this school. We're going to take away your scholarship and use it to bring someone else in. And I was, I'm out, right? So yeah. I, I left and I transferred. So you can get in situations where you're you're not welcome, I guess, more than anything. Uh, I transferred to Minnesota and uh, earned a scholarship there, and, and things things got better. But it was not, it, it was a tough decision. Um, I think it's so easy now. If 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 you're in a situation with a transfer portal where you're on a running team and you're a wide receiver, uh, and and you're like, well. They're not throwing me the ball enough. Uh, I'm going to go somewhere else. Well, who knows what's going to happen there, right? 
it's real easy to blame your circumstances mm -hmm. for, for why you're not being successful. And, and more often than not, it's you. It's not your circumstances. So yeah. especially as a young person growing, I grew three inches and 40 pounds my first year of college. Wow. Things changed. <laughs> <laughs> and and those, those kids are, are Jekyll one day and Hyde the next day. And, and one, of the, one of the great things about consistency and leadership and consistency in, in a team is that, that uh, you can learn from each other, mm -hmm. you can mentor each other, and, and that's what great teams do. Um, and and uh, hopefully um, the kids that are making those decisions on transferring are, are, are not doing it easily. I had to sit out a year. That that was the problem, right? Yep. So back in the day, it was, it was a big decision to transfer. Mm -hmm. Now when I got to the University of Minnesota, Mike Shanahan was the offensive coordinator. Tony Dungy was a graduate assistant, and Mike Martz worked in the film room. And we had an unbelievable coaching staff there, so it was a great decision for me to go there. Um, but that's not always the case. Do you follow any Colorado college football? So yeah, you sure. Boulder? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, when the, when, when the Minnesota Gophers came and played CU last year, I spoke to the team before the game and got them fired up. Oh, fun. Think nice. Was it fifty-two to nothing or something. <laughs> oh no, we we don't have to talk about that. You. No, it was unbelievable. But yeah, I got hate mail. It was it's pretty funny. I like what's going on there. Yeah, um, I mean, there's big changes. It's everyone's change. talking it's about some, it. Yeah, and it's there are situations like the Broncos are going through, like um, like CU's are going through. You, you've got to have the courage to try new things, and it's so easy to sit back and say, well, you know. We almost made it last year, or what, you know, whatever. Be honest with yourself, uh, forgive yourself for your mistakes, and, and move forward. To me, it's about that, perseverance. That's it is, it is. It, and it's not necessarily, um, you, you don't want to, you don't want to persevere too much. You don't, you don't want to say, you, you know, well, we're crappy now, but we'll get better, and not make any changes, right? You, you got to be hungry. You want to be in a situation where you're, where you're being. Uh, you're being assertive about it, and this this something needs to change. Let's figure it out, and let's try try new things. And if those don't work, we'll try something else. I'm somewhat excited about what's going on up there. Again, the the transfer students are are a challenge because they've already given up, right? They, you know that they, they have that in their in their blood, in their in their psyche that okay, I, I this isn't going to work. I give up. I'm going. Mm -hmm. You have to understand, and you have to you have to have a culture there that can absorb that and, and change those people. I I look at a team as a teeter totter, a seesaw. On, on one side, you got leaders; they think long term, they think we instead of me. Mm -hmm. they, put, they put that team passion, the team mission first. On the other side, you got egos; they think short term. Where's my money? How little can I do today and kill, still keep this job? And so, by adding or subtracting a leader or an ego, you tip that teeter totter back and forth one way or the other. And, and most of the team is in the middle. Mm -hmm. right? Most of the team, they don't know what they think, right? And th that team will slide one way or the other when it, when it tips. And so all of a sudden, you got momentum towards success. But you got to get those leaders in there. You, you, you got to get somebody like Dion. You got to get somebody who's going to make sure that people are accountable. You mm -hmm. got to get somebody like, uh, like Peyton here with the, with the Broncos, who's, who's making sure that people know what they're expected to do and, and holds them to it. Yeah. Do you think the NIL is having any effect on that seesaw? Of course. Of course. Good, bad, <laughs> no comment. <laughs> no, that's not a no, good, bad, no comment. It's changed the, the landscape in many ways, but um, in many ways it hasn't. Um, especially teams like basketball teams. You've been mm -hmm. watching the, the, the basketball madness. stuff where, you know, seven guys, if you, can, if you can pay seven guys and get seven guys in there, you, it doesn't matter what college you are, you, you, can, you can win. It's definitely changed the landscape um, in many ways. Although when I was coming out through college, uh, players at the University of Miami were getting paid. Everybody knew it. it. It wasn't, you know, it was under the table and all that stuff. But I mean, when we had Miami guys come to the Broncos, they were taking a pay cut sometimes, right? It was, <laughs> it was, it was a change. But, but there's always been, uh, haves and have nots in sports and and it's just kind of out in the open now. Yeah. All right, last thing funny. Did you have any nicknames? I did. I had a couple of them. Let's hear uh, them. The Albino Rhino. 
Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was one, and Snow Goose was another, and they both uh, came from college. They don't I can't know explain me. how it happened because I don't want you to know how it happened. But okay. These were my nicknames. All right, I won't <laughs> dig into them then. I'll just take right. it and I'll trust you. Um, Carl, thank you so much for coming today. It was my so pleasure. fun talking to you. Oh, it was fun for me too. I yeah. appreciate it. If people want to find out more about me, they can go to carlmecklenburg.com. Uh, there's video about my speaking, there's uh, feedback from past clients, and I'd love to work with you. Fun. Well, final words, Broncos country. Broncos let's country, ride. yeah, let's ride. <laughs> no, I think we're going to change that. You're, you're going to make <laughs> an executive really, decision. Yeah, we're not, we're not going back there. We're not going back there. Thank you, Carl. My pleasure. Thank you.